Thanks, Jake. Um, so I'm aware that maybe some of you had a little bit of difficult time um, hearing me. Um, so it sounds like I'm sort of booming here, but I'll, I'll speak a little closer to the uh, microphone. Please don't feel bad about putting your hand up and saying, speak up, speak up. Okay, so I know. Yep, no problem. Okay, so since we're here in Orlando, I thought we'd start off with a picture taken from um, Hollywood Studios. So this is... Jake, sorry, remind me how we get rid of the... Ah, there we go. Okay. So I put this slide in for um, a few reasons, um, but partly because Sometimes uh, making a diagnosis of periodic paralysis, I'm aware that it can feel a little bit like a roller coaster ride. And also because um, some people before an EMG test feel like, uh, feel the nervousness that you might feel when you're about to go on a ride like this. Uh, it's not a particularly pleasant test. Can I show of hands to people who've had an EMG test? Okay, so maybe a third, about a third of people. Okay. So what I'm going to take you through today is the type of testing that I do uh, as part of my practice. So um, maybe following on from the first talk, some of you may uh, be interested to know that New Zealand uh, is right at the bottom of the world uh, and uh, right next to Australia. Um, so I came a fair distance to get to that. <laughs> All right, so as Jake has already talked about, um, electrodiagnostic testing is just one part of the uh, algorithm for making a diagnosis of periodic paralysis. So uh, I've also included here a history and exam, which is obviously a very important part. Blood testing for potassium levels and genetic testing, obviously that's very important as well. And EMG testing as well. And I've left out muscle biopsy for the reason that these days we don't very often do muscle biopsies. Uh, anymore now that we have genetics and uh, other good tests or perhaps better tests for making the diagnosis. So uh, we don't always need to do all of it, but we always need to take a history and exam obviously and we almost always do potassium levels and we usually or often do EMG but we don't necessarily need to do EMG as evidenced by the fact that two thirds of the people in this room have a diagnosis and have not had an EMG study. So EMG is useful in diagnosis of periodic paralysis and non-dystrophic myotonias, which is what the MDM is there. So uh, we can diagnose paramyotonia congenita, potassium aggravated myotonia, standard myotonia congenita, as well as the four main types of periodic paralysis, hypo, thyrotoxic, hyper, and ATS. So uh, how do we do it? Well, this is the standard EMG machine that I use, uh, but there are portable, uh, portable, ver sorry, portable versions of this equipment. As I said before, this uh, EMG testing is an adjunct to clinical and genetic testing. It's not the gold standard for diagnosis. And basically what we're doing is we are quantifying electrically the response to exercise. So as you all know, when you get paralyzed or weak, that muscle becomes uh, floppy, weak, and if you check the reflexes, if your doctor taps on the knee reflex when you've got leg weakness, the knee reflex will be absent at the time of weakness, and then it will return as the muscle gets stronger again. The same thing occurs with the EMG. If we stimulate the nerve and measure the muscle response, then we can see that the muscle response diminishes at the time of weakness, and then it goes up again once the weakness attack has passed. Now one of the things that uh, is important is to standardise this test, so it needs to be done in a very controlled manner. So the temperature needs to be kept constant for obvious reasons, the limb needs to be immobilised so it's not moving all over the place, and so that's one of the reasons why different people report different sensitivities of this test. Now I'm not going to go through the test in great detail because it's a nice video clip. I think there's, a, there's quite a, a nice video clip on the PBA website of this test being done by the Fournier Group in Paris. So, I'm correct about that, Joe? Correct. Yep. So, if you are wondering more about how this test is actually done, I would suggest you watch that video. 
Okay, but what I will show you is just a couple of pictures here. So what we're doing is putting two electrodes on the muscle that we're measuring. In this case, we're doing a carpal tunnel test, but the same sort of um, principle applies for doing a CNN test. So two electrodes on the muscle, and then we stimulate the nerve with uh, what has been called a cattle prod, uh, but it's an electrical stimulator. And what we see is a, a muscle twitch, okay? And we measure that twitch on the screen as what's called a CMAP, or compound muscle action potential, okay, which is this single hump here. Now, in this case, we're looking at, we can do several things with nerve conduction studies, and most often we're looking for things like carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a pinched nerve in the wrist. And so we're measuring conduction velocities across the wrist and across the forearm, which is what we're doing here. But the, what I wanted to point out is what the CMAP is. All right, so in terms of the EMG testing, uh, there's really two broad types of testing that we do for channelopathies of, of muscle. Exercise CMAP testing, which is what we know most about, that's the long exercise test by McManus. And also, um, more recently, the short exercise test has been popularized again by the French group uh, Fournier. And this test is uh, good because it is widely deployed using standard EMG equipment. Okay, so your neurologist that does EMG testing would be able to do this test, provided they know what the protocol is, but they don't need any fancy equipment to do it. It's moderately sensitive, so some 60 to 70 percent sensitive. I have to say that I found it more like 50 to 60 percent sensitive, but the literature suggests that it's 60 to 70 percent sensitive, meaning that six to seven out of ten cases of people with PP or myotonia will be positive, will have a positive test. And when you have a positive test, it's quite specific for the diagnosis. Now, what is done less often, but more in Frank's uh, uh, neck of the woods, is uh, particularly by a Dutch uh, group, uh, is muscle fiber conduction velocity. And this is done using either electrodes that are actually put into the muscle, so intramuscular intramuscular electrodes, or sometimes using little surface electrodes, much like what I showed you. And what these, uh, what, what they're doing with this is actually measuring the conduction velocity along the muscle fibers. Now it turns out that this is much more sensitive and um, very specific for, for periodic paralysis and probably myotonia congenita as well. But the difficulty is that it's complex and it really is only done by specialized centers. So you wouldn't be able to front up to your neurologist and say, please measure my muscle fiber conduction velocity. It's just not sufficiently, uh, uh, it's, it's too complex to be able to do that. Is, is there a way we can make a video of that? Um, I am just starting to sort of get interested in doing that. But you'd have to approach the Dutch group who is um, Dick Stegeman and uh, Swartz. Now they're at Nijmegen, um, an email to them, I guess might, or um, well Frank, I don't know if you, if you know them. So, I mean, it's possible that they might be able to do a little video of that. Um, it is a little bit since they've published on it, so I'm not sure how much uh, they're doing at the present time. Oh. So, I guess there's something you wouldn't say? But we can still get them to do the video. Doctor, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 so, I had a prostitute uh, special engine for the we're talking about, and the Dutch group uh, sent us home without medication. And um, well, they saw the videos. They saw Thomas uh, in full body paralysis because we have no uh, known gene yet. They said no, so. so that's that's good. <laughs> um, so, yes, they um, do do it, but perhaps you might not be going to Holland to get it done anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <coughs> all right, so I'll just give you a little bit of background about the McManus test. So uh, McManus is a, was, he's actually died, uh, which is quite sad. He was an Australian neurologist who was training at the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, 
in the 80s, and together with um, colleagues at the, at the uh, at, um, Mayo Clinic, uh, reported this test in muscle and nerve in 1986. So it's been around, you know, coming up 30 years now, but it sort of is the the default uh, the default EMG test that we do for periodic paralysis. So as I mentioned before, the weakness in periodic paralysis is caused by reduced electrical excitability of muscle. Okay, so if we uh, stimulate that muscle, the CMAP that we obtain from that muscle will be reduced when the muscle is weak, and then will become normal again once the muscle becomes stronger again and once the attack has passed. Now we build in an exercise protocol to try to produce the weakness, and we'll talk about what that exercise is, but it's not full body exercise, it is just exercising the muscle, the abductor digiti minimi muscle, which is just on this side of the, on this side of the hand, and we put the electrodes on that muscle, and the movement is going to be to spread the fingers. Okay, so we're exercising that muscle, not whole body exercise. And they, they, this group generated criteria that if the CMAP size drops by 40% during or, sorry, or after exercise, uh, then it's a positive test. And I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. So this is actually data reported. So in normal people, when you do this, you get a slight, now these are all CMAPs each, each one is so this is in a control person somebody with hyper-PP, hypo-PP, and ATS. Okay, so during the exercise, a normal person, the CMAP goes up ever so slightly, maybe about 10%, and then basically stays constant, no matter how long you follow it after exercise. So this is a, this is a normal person, that's the response. Contrast that to, yes? These, these uh, charts, these graphs of, of, of those responses, of, 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 the, of the people that are affected, those are all during non attack period. Right? That's correct. So that shows that our muscles are no good, even when we're good. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some of these people are on medicine, some of them are not, but we'll come to that in a little bit. But yeah, these are people who are not having attacked. Can you just repeat his comments? Yeah, so the comment was, were these tests done in the middle of an attack or in between attacks? And the answer is, no, these are done in between attacks. Okay, so the patient with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, you see a rise in the CMAP, right in the second uh, recording here, and then a progressive drop, and I think you'll agree this is a pretty, pretty dramatic drop in the CMAP amplitude that occurs really within about well, starts probably about five minutes, and then by the time you get to 40 minutes, it's really a tiny little response. So I don't think anybody would quibble that that's a positive response. Similarly, in hypokalemic, we get the same sort of thing. Maybe not quite as dramatic. And in anderson tarwell syndrome, the same sort of thing. So as you can see, looking at these three graph, these three different cases, you wouldn't be able to tell which one has which type of periodic paralysis from looking at that but they all have a positive test. So why might you have a negative McManus test? Well, it's negative in up to 30 to 40% of people. I must say that my experience is more like 40 to 50%, but clearly it's not a perfect test. Well, the obvious answer is, well, it's not a channelopathy of the periodic paralysis type. So that's one possibility. But it may be that it is a channelopathy of the periodic paralysis type, but the person is on treatment for that. So if, if you're taking a cetazolamide or Inspira or any sort of treatment potassium, then it may be that the test is negative. If you're not having attacks you know, very often, it may be that the test is negative for that reason. In that situation, ideally you would stop treatment and repeat the test. Now, obviously not everybody wants to stop the treatment to repeat the test, but that would be the ideal thing to do if you're gonna make the diagnosis. It may be that the test wasn't done with adequate standardization, so the limb wasn't kept immobilized, the temperature wasn't kept constant, uh, the exercise wasn't done according to standard protocols, and it may be in that case that you need to repeat the test with better controlled environment. It may be that the test result is borderline, so it's not definitely normal, but it doesn't meet the 40% cutoff to call it an abnormal test. Now in that situation, I suggest you repeat the test. Here's an example of a patient of mine with hyperkalemic periodic paralysis who had a normal CMAP test according to criteria, but actually it's very abnormal. 
So the, the, the abnormalities here are several. The first is that the CMAP amplitude starts off at 2 millivolts. Now normal would be 6 or greater. So it's starting off at a very low level. And then with exercise, which is the grey part here, it rises. And then it progressively rises in the post-exercise period. So it's doing the exact opposite of what it should normally do. Start high and then drop. So this is... A, you know, a negative CMAP test, but in actual fact it's very abnormal and this person has a, a bona fide T704M mutation in the sodium channel. So we did repeat the test for the second time round. Now a much more typical uh, positive result with the, the baseline here of just over 3 millivolts, raises a bit during exercise and then progressively falls and if we use the McManus criteria, 46% decrement, so that's a positive test. So, you know, negative test first time round, positive test the second time round. So clearly, doing multiple tests does increase the sensitivity for the diagnosis. So the, you've got to take, with any test, you've got to take the good with the bad, and that certainly applies with the McManus test. I mean, the good is that it's non-invasive, at least as compared to a muscle biopsy. Uh, it has reasonably good sensitivity, we'll say 60 to 70 percent, that's the quoted figure. And it's fairly easy to perform on standard EMG equipment and with relatively little training this can be done. So those are, those are good things. The bad side of the equation is that it's probably a fairly blunt instrument for, for detecting more subtle abnormalities. So in a, in a person with a milder PP phenotype you may not find the, the abnormality or if the person's not having many attacks. Uh, it is an acquiescent phase of the disease, you may have a negative test. It doesn't distinguish between the different types of periodic paralysis. Well, that's a relatively small quibble because we have genetic tests that can do that now. And the main issue, other issue, is that the false negatives may be up to 30 to 40 percent of cases, as I, as I talked about before. So you can't really use it as a standalone test. So why do it? Well, I, mean, I think it still has a, a role to play because we know that no test is perfect, genetics are not perfect either. If you have a positive test, well then in certain cases you may not pro proceed to doing further genetic testing. It makes the diagnosis and you can just get on with treatment with the diagnosis. Um, not everybody has access to genetic testing. In New Zealand, for example, we have to send it overseas and it costs a fair bit of money. It takes months and months to return. And so it's not routinely employed, whereas it probably would be in North America and Europe. And I guess a plug from my standpoint is, I know it's uncomfortable, I've had it done myself. Um, it allows a better understanding of what's actually going on at the muscle membrane level and probably allows us to understand these diseases better. And it also, when you have a, 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 an, an, an atypical response like this top one here, if we have more of those, we can get a better understanding of how to interpret this test when it's a little bit atypical. So, I, I guess my personal opinion is that most people should have a McManus test if they can possibly tolerate it, um, and so that you know we can get as much information as we can about you know electrodiagnostic testing and, and periodic paralysis. Could we update it? It's now 30 odd years old. Could we make it a little bit more updated into the 2000s? Well, I think it would be helpful to look at a few more uh, aspects of that CMAP. So, I've put some arrows here. So, if you compare not just the size of the CMAP, but also the morphology, you can see that here it's got a little single hump. And in this one, you've got two little humps, the slope of the response. So, these are, these are subtle things that EMG is looking at. Um, and also the differences in this little, this here compared to this here. So there's a few different aspects of the CMAP that we could look at that might give us a little bit more information about uh, periodic paralysis and might increase the sensitivity of this test. Um, other things that can be done, well we could add in an exercise regimen as Jake was talking about earlier. We could um, add in a potassium challenge component. I'm not really a big fan of that because I think that maybe the risks outweigh the benefits a little bit. One thing that I am interested in is using accelerometers. So you can now get little tiny accelerometers that you can that basically measure acceleration. Uh, that you can put on a, on a finger and you can actually measure the force generated by that muscle. So not only could you measure the electrical response to stimulation, you could measure the force generated by the muscle 
and the two may actually give you quite useful information in addition to just measuring the electrical response that we do now. But at the end of the day, there's only so much that you can do with this simple test. It's, it's not, it's not uh, it really is, a, it's going to be a fairly blunt instrument for looking at muscle membrane excitability. So, some of you may have read about the short exercise test, which has now been used a lot more for diagnosing periodic paralysis. And so this was originally, the protocol was originally developed by a guy called Stride. Uh, and I think the late 70s, but Fournier and the French colleagues have refined it and now what they do is three iterations of short exercise. And by short exercise I mean 10 seconds. So same muscle, the abductor digiti minimi muscle. The exercise is just the same, 10 seconds of finger spreading. And that's the little two hashed parts here, it's the exercise. Followed by stimulations at 10 second intervals for 60 seconds. So this thing is all done in sort of three minutes. And if you compare the response and controls here to people with myotonia congenita, you can see that there's fairly clearly uh, abnormalities here. And just like the warm-up phenomenon that you get with myotonia congenita, you see the same thing here with the decrement in the CMAP. It's most prominent after the first set of exercise, it gets better and better by the second and third sets of exercise. Contrast that to the sodium channel problem, where the CMAP just gets greater and greater with successive exercise. And then, curiously, other sodium channel mutations, so same gene but a different mutation, gives you the exact reverse, where it just gets worse and worse with repeated exercise. Same gene, one causing hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, one causing paramyotonia congenita, completely different responses to exercise. And in fact, this group has published a, a, a sort of an algorithm, a step, which you go, a set of steps that you go through, and you can actually predict, in some patients, you can actually predict the mutation and the ion channel based on the response to exercise that you get. So we are getting better and better at this, but um, I'd have to say it's still uh, genetic testing and still, uh, I think, got the edge. Was Right. Is that hyper or hypo? I mean, I uh, so T704M is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, yeah. So I haven't, I, haven't got, I haven't shown slides for hypo on that particular slide, but they, they do have it in the paper. Um, do I think all yes, I'll just give you the microphone. <coughs> I visited Dr. Hudson Gay uh, two months ago and it was very surprising to find anything. So muscles react uh, with paralysis and weakness, but don't show it on his test. That's all. Yeah. What then? <laughs> then? Then what? <laughs> Yeah, so the comment was, uh, uh, the clinical history strongly suggests very high paralysis, but the electrical testing is completely negative. Yep, I've seen that as well. And um, you scratch your head and you go back to more relying on the uh, clinical history and the genetic testing. And sometimes, as Jake said earlier, you just treat it empirically. And I can certainly know at least one person uh, in New Zealand where that's exactly what we're doing. So you're, you're not alone, it happens. No, no. Is it possible? I'm sorry. Is it possible on the AMG that they come back and just say it's a bilateral, bilateral neuropathy instead of going the other direction because they don't know? Because I had the AMG and they, they just came back and said I had bilateral uh, neuropathy, and uh, I just don't know if that plays into it at all. Yeah. So the question was about whether uh, whether uh, when they're not sure what's going on, whether. Uh, Neuropathy might be identified as part of the problem. Yeah, and the, the point there is that EMG picks up a lot of other things as well. So you may find things on the EMG testing which uh, are not actually related to periodic analysis. Does the, does, the neuro <clears throat> does the neuropathy findings look like the EMG findings? Or is it very different? Yeah, so, so I think what, what you're referring to in your case is... Well, they, they, they did the carpal on both. Yeah. They did help. So they found a couple of times. They also gave me said that uh, bilateral ulnar neuropathy 
well. I just didn't know if they were in the same category. Yeah, no, different problems. So, so that slide that I showed you at the beginning is what we're doing most often with nerve conduction studies, because remember, PP is rare, and so, you know, nine times out of ten, you're looking for something other than PP. Right. So most of the time, what it's being done for is looking for carpal tunnel syndrome, pinched nerve in the wrist, or in the elbow. And so, you know, statistically, those things are way more common than PP, and so um, it's really a different, it's a completely different problem, but people who have PP may also have carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, and so that would be found on this testing here, where we're measuring the conduction velocity across the wrist segment for carpal tunnel syndrome, or the conduction velocity across the elbow. So it's really a, it's a different type of measurement. Using the same equipment, but we're really measuring a different thing. Thank you, sorry. It just occurred to me, I breezed over a video of my time here in my previous talk. Um, Many of you are probably wondering what myotonia sounds like. Is it okay if I yeah. show that? That might be easier said than done. But... So, what we need is actually a bit of volume here. Um... Yeah, that's the volume. Yeah, there you go. There we go. So I'll play that again. So it's not so much the video, it's the audio. Are you pulling the patient's finger now or are you <laughs> 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 Okay, I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I'm going to stop there. So does anyone, anyone want to suggest a politically correct sound of what this sounds like? Yeah, yeah I mean, textbooks say this is a dive bomber sound. Yeah. So they, they, that's my tone here. Okay, and so the patient that has the growth myotonia that you saw earlier on, this would be what we'd find when we put a needle into that person's muscle. So this is a little EMG needle, a little fine needle that we put into the muscle, like a little wire, and we listen to the muscle, and if you're lucky, you'll hear something like that, which will help you make the diagnosis. So it's that noise that you heard. I'll just play that one more time. Some of that data is based on they did the test multiple times and took the abnormal one. Okay, so I, so that's one of the reasons why the sensitivity in their paper may be a little higher than what we find in real life. But my general impression is if you do it multiple times, you probably do increase the sensitivity. Um, and I think that case I showed where the first one was abnormal but negative, um, second time round was more was more abnormal and clearly abnormal uh, was helpful. Uh, the first part of a dietary modification, yeah, great question. I, I don't know. I mean, I suspect that I generally um, try to do the testing when people are off medication. Obviously, somebody who is on medication and doing well is particularly unkeen to stop medication if it's working. So then you've got to say, well, how much do I need this piece of information? To it may be that you don't need it at all. 
But yes, I think that the sensitivity is higher when you're off medication. Um, about potassium, I don't know the answer to that question, actually. It's a very interesting thing to study. Oh, oh yep. Yeah. Um, I have I have myotonia congenita. I have two um, mutations on my Glory channel, but I present with paramyotonia co congenita symptoms. I have the eyelids, the hands. I've had total body myotonia, head to feet, um, and I also have hypoglycemic periodic paralysis. I've been hospitalized um, with an attack and had my potassium drawn low. Um, and so for me, and then I, I'm temperature sensitive, so cold induces myotonia and heat induces paralysis. Um, and exercise produces myotonia during the attack and then I have paralysis to follow. So I have both um, things there and that you might think that's interesting because when I had read this, um, I, I looked at all these online, all these um, conferences that they had previously, I was sure I was gonna have a sodium channel because I fall right into that, but it turned out to be a chloride channelopathy. I'm actually quite glad I'm not your neurologist. <laughs> so very tough to manage. But yeah, so I would agree with you. I mean, I would have said most likely sodium channel problem, um, but you said we have recessive myotonia congenita, so two, two. Uh, um, I have one that's unknown and one that's known. Okay, all right. Yeah, and maybe it's the fact that it's a little bit different. As, I can't explain many of those symptoms because I mean what you describe would be fairly typical of a sodium channel right. problem. So maybe on sodium patients you should check their fluoride too. Yeah, and the part of the problem, well, at least in New Zealand, when you've done one test that costs you know, a couple of thousand dollars and you've right. got an abnormality, you're sort of not really allowed to keep looking. But it would be a fascinating <laughs> thing to, to look at. Yeah. Frank, do you have any comments? Uh, I have a comment. Uh, I have a comment to the long exercise test as itself. I do it regularly and it's a very good test for muscle fiber membrane excitability. Of course it's not specific, but if you have a normal membrane long exercise test, you have a normal muscle fiber membrane excitability. And even if you have a background paralysis and you feel well, and you're well equipped and you have good medication, you have a normal test. And if you are not in not so good shape, the sensitivity, the diagnostic sensitivity will increase of that test because it's a very good um, thing for muscle fiber membrane excitability. The um, problem is that it's very prone to technical errors. It's easy to perform, but it's very easy to get a false positive test because it's easy to manage for the EMG technician or the physician to make a decrement, to make a drop in the CMP amplitude. Yeah, we, we have it until 11.30, it's 11.10. Uh, so if we don't have a lot of questions from the audience, we can jump to questions from the webinar. <coughs> I'm wondering the way there are false negatives if there's false positives of the EMG. Um, because I've had things show up, but then they've said they can't replicate them. And it calls it negative. Yeah, when, by EMG you mean the McManus test, I take it, you mean the, 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 the exercise. The, the short. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, 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 the 10 seconds of exercise. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So, um, then. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the question was, uh, can you have false positive results as false negative? Yeah, I mean, I've certainly uh, encountered uh, at least one person with a false positive long exercise test. Um, I've not encountered that with a short exercise test, but again, I guess I think it could happen. Probably there, when you went back and looked at it and did it again, you would find that actually there were some technical problems with the test the first time around. Maybe the temperature wasn't kept constant, the limb wasn't kept uh, immobilized, and as Frank was pointing out, you, you probably find there were technical issues that explained the first time around. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I have seen it once with a long exercise test. I had multiple EMGs, probably six or seven in my day, past 15 years. 
I've never had a short or long muscle um, scan, an EMG done. And I'm wondering if the, it did show up abnormal um, for high excitability in my arm as well as my leg. And I'm wondering if it's worth having it done. Can, and my question is, do, does any neurologist do this type of testing? Yeah, so, so good question. Um, so uh, the simple answer is no, not any neurologist does this test. You have to be trained in EMG, um, so not all neurologists are trained in EMG. And having said that, not all, trained, not all neurologists who are trained in EMG do the test either, or feel comfortable doing the test. So probably if you're going to have it done, it would be best done by a, by a specialised centre uh, where they have a neuromuscular clinic where they uh, see patients with periodic paralysis and, and related diseases, rather than going to a private local neurologist, you know, now that may not be possible. Laurie, you're going to New Zealand. <laughs> so, uh, probably close to Europe, actually, but, uh, Europe. Uh, oh, Europe. Yeah. 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 So, so you've never had a CMAP test done? I've never had one done. I've, I've, I've been uh, having an issue 15 years, seen eight neurologists in my day, and never suggested that test. Right. Can I ask, is the diagnosis of periodontal paralysis firm or not so firm? Not so firm. Not so firm, yeah. It is, it is a diagnosis, and it is, I'm treated with potassium. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so I don't really think it's a test that is used for monitoring disease activity quite so much uh, as making a diagnosis. So you probably have the test done at the time of diagnosis and then really go by clinical and potassium levels and maybe uh, MRI uh, in the future rather than uh, exercise CMAP testing. But, but occasionally it's done for research purposes but, but not routinely. Um, and what would you deduce from three symptomatic family members who've had negative genetic testing, but they've all had um, McMahon, positive McManus tests? Well, without knowing exact scenarios, it's a little bit difficult to comment, but I guess they would fall into that 20 to 30 percent of people that have periodic paralysis with negative genetic testing. So um, the McManus is clearly positive, and the history is compelling. Then I think you can say, well, it's 20 to 30 percent, you know, it's PP, but in, in a gene that we haven't figured out yet. Or go back and look at maybe it's doing gene sequencing in a different part of the gene, or maybe it's an unusual mutation. Or you'd have to look more closely at the genetic testing, I think. But uh, you know, 20, 30, 20 to 30 percent of the time, the genetic testing is negative as we as we know. I would just add that if you have three family members with a positive test, that's, that's a right family for genetic research anyway, because the more family members you have affected, uh, the more likely it is that you can find the gene because they, they just have ways of doing that. So, um, Are women with hypoglenic periodic paralysis less likely than men to have a large potassium drop um, with their attacks? Um, and could that account for why women are diagnosed less often than men? <laughs> <laughs> are, are women with hypoclimic periodic paralysis less likely than men to have large potassium drops with their attacks? Um, I don't think one could make sort of sex specific comments on differences in potassium drops. That's not been sort of my experience, but um, it's more patient specific. So that's, that's, I guess, the first part. And what was the, uh, just remind me, second part question. Okay. Is that why women are less, less oh, than men diagnosed with it? Yeah, so, so that is, the, the second part of the question is that the reason why women are men, less likely to be diagnosed than men. I think it's probably more complicated than that. It has to do with the, the fact that the phenotype 
the expression of the disease is often milder. And the, I mean, why that is, we do not know. Well, it? but if expression is milder, is it milder weakness or a milder drop in potassium? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Um, I just wanted to add one thing to, the, to that. The, there, there are two types of drops of, in potassium that one should consider. The drop in potassium that triggers a hypokalemic periodic paralysis episode, and then the drop in potassium that results from the muscle swelling. So you could imagine different reasons for each of those. The triggering one, it may be that some people are less likely to eat a lot of salt or a huge carbohydrate meal than others. Uh, for the, the, once the attack has gotten underway, if you have less muscle, you presumably will have less muscle swelling and less potassium drop as a result of that. So, so you have to distinguish the, the different parts and, and there may be different, different effects and it may not be gender per se, it may be the kinds of things people do or the amount of muscle mass that they have. Yeah, good point. Should everyone have a muscle biopsy? I asked that. <laughs> I think in 2013. I emailed it to the women. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not actually had a muscle biopsy. I'd volunteer for an EMG any day, but I don't think I'd volunteer for a muscle biopsy. No, but I, I mean, I, the, the, the question really is if, if, uh, if you don't have a diagnosis and the muscle vacuolization is reasonably specific, I mean, uh, yeah, well, it's, I don't think muscle vacuolization is that specific. I mean, you see it with a variety of conditions, as you talked about. So, um, uh, I don't think in this day and age the muscle biopsy is, is warranted for making the diagnosis of PP. I guess it certainly might be warranted when you have, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're unsure about the diagnosis and other conditions are coming to mind, such as the ones you mentioned up there, um, then yes, you might do a muscle biopsy to exclude those other conditions. But I think if really the diagnosis of periodic paralysis is, is on the table, I, I don't personally think that a muscle biopsy is required. Frank, comments? A muscle biopsy is good for structural myopathy, not for functional myopathy. So to exclude structural biopathy, muscle biopsy is a very good um, thing. Otherwise, I think it's not necessary. And what diagnoses other than periodic paralysis would you consider for someone who's had a positive long exercise EMG? Um, I guess uh, there really aren't too many other diagnoses that you would consider. I guess I'd go back. I mean, does the history fit clinically? And so, oh, volume. volume. Okay. So the question was: um, Are there any other diagnoses that would cause a positive exercise test other than periodic paralysis? And I, I guess if the history, uh, so then I would go back to, to look at the history, and, and if the history is compelling and it all sort of fits together, that's fine. If the history is not consistent, then the first question is why are you doing an exercise test? Right. Um, and um, uh, I think that you know it is highly specific in the order of sort of ninety-eight ish percent specific. So provided there are technical explanations for it, um, it should be indicative of PP. I, I guess I would add, and, and, and I've never done this test. I've just seen it and heard about it. Uh, but I don't think that people. I don't know that they they've done the test on like the array of, of neuromuscular diseases that are out that have it. Not the array, but, but McManus's cohort. That's okay. So the, the original cohort by McManus and people who have subsequently studied it, like Kunzer and colleagues, um, uh, did look at other neuromuscular diseases, myotonic dystrophy and a variety of other things. And, and there was one patient with myotonic dystrophy who did have a positive test, so I, get that, I guess that would be a diagnosis you might think about. But again, that's a diagnosis that clinically is quite different to periodic paralysis. So you should, you know, neurologists should be able to sort that out relatively quick, relatively easily. Um, so yes, they have looked at other neuromuscular diseases, maybe not you know, a huge range of neuromuscular diseases, but they have. That's it? Okay, oh, so um, we have a couple of extra minutes. I just wanted to put uh, Lori on the spot. Um, you know, they, there, there, they, there are, there's this machine at uh, a home potassium testing unit called the iStat. 
that um, I don't know if they're still making it or if they make it, they make it specifically for hospitals. Uh, it's one of those like holy grail things for periodic paralysis patients. Gee whiz, I would love to have a like a glucometer, like a potassium measurement at home that I'll know if I'm high or too low or normal, and that kind of can guide how much potassium I can take. Uh, so, so um, Abbott is the maker of this, and uh, there was a period of time where they gave the iStat free for compassionate use to certain individuals, like 10 years ago. And, uh, and if you're with one of those individuals, you got the iStat, they let you maintain it to this day. But they don't give you, they're, they're not doing that anymore, and I think that the thing costs like five or 10,000 bucks. Uh, and you have to have certification, and you, They'll only now give it if you're a doctor and doing clinical testing in a clinical facility. They make all kinds of paperwork. It's not just that you can go to a store and buy it for your home use. So uh, I would love to, if someone has a pet project to work with Abbott, they shut me down in the past, but you know we should keep on revisiting the issue every couple of years because things change. Uh, to try to get this going again, this compassionate use business, uh, I think for periodic paralysis it would be awesome. I just wanted to uh, have Lori comment on her, you know, use with that and stuff. Well, about 10 years ago, I called Abbott and asked them, is there a testing machine for potassium? And they said, yes, and I have. I said, how do I get one? And they said, well, you simply need a doctor's prescription and some training. And I said, how much? And they said, nothing. And I almost fell over. <laughs> and uh, so since that time, I've had the use of the iStat 1. Um, recently upgraded, I have, have the iStat, now I have the iStat 1. And I did need to go with training and a doctor's prescription yearly. And it's free. It's honestly free. You do need to pay for lancets and capillary tubes. And you need to do it in a, um, a mindful, careful setting. You need to have your hand warm. You can't squeeze the blood. You have to do it carefully. But it's a very, very accurate test, and you get your results within a minute, which is good for me because I have these, these swings of potassium issues. And my doctor is quite happy about this. He continues the scripts, and the, uh, the, ca the cartridges that you put the capillary blood into, those are provided by Abbott for free as well. So. The whole process, I would hope that, and Abbott says uh, that on the last training that I had, they said they, can, they do this as a payback for the community and for the compassionate, compassionate users program. So it's a great program, and I would hope more of us could get that. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Oh, we have a question, and uh, Linda wanted to mention something. Yeah. I, I just wanted to echo what Lori said. I am also one of the patients that has a iStat that was recently uh, upgraded to their brand new edition. And it was instrumental in me getting my diagnosis uh, genetically confirmed because I was able to keep track of my potassium on a daily basis and watch it go, you know, high, low, the problem with me was that it never varied, so that's why I turned out to be normal kalemic. But it is just a fabulous device, and uh, I agree with Jake. We need to, as a group, um, really go after Abbott and try to get this reinstated as something that is used for compassionate use. Great. Uh, so there's a couple of questions, and we'll get them. Uh, there is another, you know, potassium meter uh, that measures uh, electrolytes in, like, for farming water or, or, you know, for agricultural use and stuff. So it's not medically, you know, approved by the FDA. Uh, some people use it, the Cardi meter, or the Hariba you were talking about, the Hariba uh, Cardio. Um, I, I, I would have to say that I would discourage that use of that instrument, frankly, because there's, it's wrought with potential uh, errors in how to do it. That said, there are individuals with periodic paralysis who, who do, I think, swear by it. Uh, and there are some videos on the internet on how to do this. And, uh, you know, I, that's at your own risk. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, base therapy on that. I, mean, I tried to use it many years ago, and I couldn't get it, uh, I couldn't get it to work. Um, so we have three hey, questions there. Order, no, so that's a new one. so. No, I mean, it's new one. Uh, much improved. Much improved. Much improved. Have you used it? I haven't used it. No. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have it with it. Do you use it? Okay. Yeah, basically, there is 
new one. I used the old one. I didn't like the old one. I have not used the new one. So we have at least one person using or having the new one. Yeah. So is anyone else using the new one? There's a hand. Yes, of all. Is this the saliva one you guys were talking about? That's yeah. like yeah. three, three fifty yeah. seventy five instead of five thousand ten thousand dollars. Yeah, yes, it's the saliva one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Anything you put on? Yes. And I haven't ordered it because I wanted to ask um, people here, but it was closer to what you need instead of going to the hospital and having to be. So as a, as a doctor, I would say even the new one, if it's not an FDA approved device, it's not great. I'm hearing from uh, Kelly that uh, you can put blood or saliva even though it's for saliva. Someone had a question here? Raise their hand. I, I also have the new one and it's, it's great and I tested it with the hospital and I also have potassium that fluctuates all the time so um, I found it very beneficial. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's a new machine and there's something that we can test with the hospital uh, time, what they want to set up for lunch. Uh, it's worth exploring. I don't want to dismiss something completely out of hand for that, so we should look into that. Uh, what, there was one more over here. Someone want to raise their hand? Yes, no? Raise your hand now or forever. Oh. You know, I like to call, Okay, I mean, if it's a matter of just needing a doctor to be trained and stuff, I mean, I, I wonder if we can't figure out a way. We'll have to solve that problem, but that's a solvable problem. It's very solvable. Um, I figured out a way. We have a parish nurse problem a program at church at RM, and she trained me through a conference call. That's how we did my training. Not the doctor, not the doctor's nurse. Great. Okay, I guess, um, oh, Ed gets one last thing, and then we got to break and hold, you know, break your questions. Apparently they will bend a little bit because I used to be a paramedic and they accepted that. Yeah, so they will, they will with bend. the training yes. that I had, I was able in. to be trained. Right. Right. They're bendable. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. One last. Um, that's more for you because you, would, you told my mom to remind you to ask something. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, just, you know, there, there's some people who want to know which other people are here. So, uh, is it, who, has, who feels they have Anderson to Will or has Anderson to Will? Has someone wanted to know just to kind of like, any, any possibilities? So there's one in the back there. Uh, okay, that, that was it. Okay. Okay, so we're going to break for lunch.